I have the uh, honor and pleasure of not only welcoming you to Iran's regional uh, operations, this event is organized by the UCLA Center for Middle East Development and co-sponsored by the Luskin School of Public Policy at UCLA. We have a stimulating uh, event, what an event it's going to be, planned uh, for you today, moderated by someone who has been so helpful uh, to CMED, Hanin Gadar, who is the Friedman Fellow at the Washington Institute's Gidul, I hope I got that uh, pronounced right, Gidul program uh, on Arab politics, where she focuses on Shia politics throughout the Levant, the longtime managing editor of Lebanon's uh, now uh, uh, news website. Gadar uh, sheds light on a broad range of cutting edge issues from uh, the evolution of Hezbollah inside Lebanon's fractured political system to Iran's going influence throughout the Middle East. In addition, uh, she has contributed to a number of US based magazines and newspapers. Prior to joining now in 2007, Gadar wrote for the Lebanese newspapers, uh, I Safir, uh, Al Nahar and uh, Al Hayat, and also worked as a researcher for the United Nations Development Program Regional Office. Ladies and gentlemen, our chair for the day. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today to this uh, very interesting and possibly very stimulating uh, discussion. And I have to say it's also very timely because we cannot talk about Iran's regional operations ongoing operations without thinking about these operations, so the discussions of these operations on, in Vienna as we speak, it is, it is it's probably part of, of the Iran-US uh, um, uh, nuclear talks. As they resume in Vienna, the escalation between Iran, its proxies, and it is adversaries in the region continue and escalate actually from, all the way from, from, from uh, Lebanon to Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and so on. And these escalations, these incidents are forcing themselves on the negotiating table and might lead to possible complications or shifts in the discussions and maybe delays. And it might change the deal as it used to be. We are here to discuss Iran's operations in the region amid uh, the nuclear talks. And what are these uh, operations? How are these operations going to develop? Are they going to be really on the negotiating table, and if they do, what are the scenarios and what are the repercussions if they do and if they don't? And how the deal could shape the Iranian regional dynamics and the reactions of regional proxies. And I'm sure that our three fantastic speakers for today have uh, a, a lot of information, insights, and analysis on, on the link between these operations and the talks in Vienna. We have three great speakers today, and I would like to introduce them to you before we uh, start the discussion. We are going to um, have introductory remarks by these speakers, followed by Q&A. Uh, we have Kirsten uh, Fonteros, Director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. We also have Dr. Ruzbe Parsi, he's the head of the MENA program at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs, and also retired General Michael Herzog, who's the international fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Kirsten, uh, Ruzbe, and uh, Michael to this discussion. We are very excited to hear your insights. And uh, please, uh, we can, if we can start with Kirsten with five minutes followed by Ruth Bay and last but definitely not least is Michael. So uh, Kirsten, would you like to start, uh, uh, kick off the discussion, please? Thank you so much, I'll be happy to. And it's great to be here. I feel like there are so many conversations about related topics, but, but I think this one's really going to get a little more into the weeds and I'm eager to take notes when the other panelists speak. So. Um, my role here is really to talk about kind of where the U.S. is right now, and we expect the deal being discussed in Vienna to offer three things in Iran for to Iran in exchange for a return to compliance with the previous JCPOA limitations on their nuclear program. And these three things are prisoner exchange, lifting of oil sanctions, and unfreezing of some Iranian ass assets that are held outside the country. Talks appear to have progressed far enough that they're actually in the weeds now on which specific centrifuges will have to be shut down. 
But on sanctions, as many of us are tracking, Iran reportedly insists on the lifting of some sanctions. They're not related to the nuclear program, and this is still a point of contention. There are about four buckets, the way the U.S. sees it, uh, of sanctions in place right now. And one includes things like CT sanctions on the Central Bank for funding Hezbollah or sanctions against Iranian ministers for supporting the IRGC. Biden can choose to lift some of these, but they won't be easy to lift because one, they have nothing to do with Iran's nuclear compliance, and two, the activities they are imposed against are still going on in Iran. But the U.S. would like to see a deal as soon as possible, and Tehran knows that. The variable that no one on the U.S. team has control over is whether or not the Supreme Leader wants to see a deal happen before or after Iran's presidential election in mid-June. So while the U.S. team is focused on the details of the deal, they also have to keep an eye on Congress. There is a bipartisan support right now for a few issues in what we, you know, what we're looking at is the sort of split Congress. And they include things like support for being tough on China, but looking for space for cooperation and finding a political solution to the war in Yemen and limiting Iran's ability to use proxies, missiles and drones to destabilize the Middle East. So finalizing a deal that is considered bad by even a slim majority in Congress will impact the faith Congress has in Biden's foreign policy team, and what that means that will lead to more scrutiny in granting authorities, in approving appropriations, and it will mean additional burdensome reporting requirements for the team going forward. Right now, there are 47 pieces of legislation that have been introduced in Congress that are directly related to or would touch on Iran, 17 in the Senate, 30 in the House. Two have passed the House already, one on the positive side, it's the No Ban Act that would reduce the president's ability to prohibit immigration by executive order, and one on the negative side about cyber, the Cyber Diplomacy Act of 2021. Another example, which is gathering bipartisan co-sponsors fast, is House Resolution 118, backed by the MEK and others, which is titled, Expressing Support for the Iranian People's Desire for a Democratic, Secular, and Non-Nuclear Republic of Iran and Condemning Violations of Human Rights and State-Sponsored Terrorism by the Iranian Government. End of title. But included in its language, and I'll quote here, is a call on relevant United States government's agencies to work with European allies, including those in the Balkans where Iran has expanded its presence, to hold Iran accountable for breaching diplomatic privileges and to call on nations to prevent the malign activities of the Iranian regime's diplomatic missions with the goal of closing them down. So there are some teeth behind this kind of thing, and we'll all be watching this debate in Congress. Any new nuclear deal, the Biden administration is able to finalize will be followed immediately by an expectation from nearly all stakeholders that the U.S. begin negotiations on a parallel agreement to limit the threat Iran poses to U.S. partners and interests in the region via armed militias and the increasing reach of its crews, ballistic and unmanned munitions. The Congress will press for this. Israel will press for this. The Gulf will press for this. Europe will press for this. At the same time, if past behavior is any indication, we can expect that Iran will increase funding to these precise programs once sanctions relief give it some breathing room. Within months, there will be headlines about the number of attacks occurring or illicit arms flowing, and this will add pressure on Team Biden. The problem for the team is that meeting this expectation for immediate negotiations on a parallel regional behaviors deal is outside of their control. A convinced contingent of Iran watchers do not believe that Iran has any intention of entering into any agreement that curbs the proxy sponsorship their leadership has referred to in past years as a pillar of their foreign policy, nor in scaling back development of rockets and missiles that make it more and more capable of reaching adversaries far afield and which they insist are a piece of their deterrence. This could mean that the Biden team by the end of 2021 will have a nuclear deal, but enter into a protracted struggle to pressure and incentivize Tehran to self-limit the programs it perceives as most crucial to its security and influence, with pressure on it to do so from the US public, its partners in the region, its transatlantic partners, oh, and with opposing pressure likely from Russia. Good luck, right? I mean, this is an unfair expectation, but it is an expectation that the Biden team will set if the renewed JCPOA does not address these issues. So as long as Iran does not intend to curb these activities, the US will be running in place in this purgatory of trying to please everyone. It appears the Gulf now is taking this reality seriously and is thinking about its own security, should this likely scenario come to pass. And perhaps that is the silver lining here. The US will certainly encourage Gulf Iran talks about de-escalation. And if the Gulf itself winds up arriving at deals that scale back Iran's support for violent groups or use of missiles and drones, everyone wins. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. This was uh, amazing, short, concise, and to the point. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we will come back to you with more questions during the discussion to elaborate on many of these points. I have myself many questions. Um, we can continue now with uh, uh, Ruzbe, if you want to uh, present your introduction, and then uh, we, go for, we go with Michael before we open the Q&A. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this panel and look forward to the conversation and the discussion. Um, following on what Kirsten said, let me then try a kind of a small operation of hermeneutics, channeling what people in Tehran might think in general, but also as a kind of response to what Kirsten has said. Um, first of all, the JCPOA is not renegotiable. It's enshrined in the UN Security Council resolution and what they're negotiating now is the return of the one party that has broken the deal, which would be the United States. Now, this might seem like a detail uh, from the perspective of DC or Tel Aviv, but it's not really a detail. It's quite important because what we're dealing with here is a broken trust. And it's about US credibility to be able to honor an agreement. And the big question mark there, of course, is what happens when the next US president is elected? If it's Biden again, Kamala Harris, or Mike Pompeo. That is, how much is a signature from the US president worth? And why should anyone in Tehran stick out their neck again, politically, based on something that might change 180 degrees in a couple of years again? So that's one issue. And that's why the conversations in Vienna are not about missiles at the moment, nor should anyone expect them to be nor do the Russians, the Chinese, or the Europeans expect them to be that. It's about whether you can save the first working agreement in which the United States and Iran managed not only to agree to something, but at least for a couple of years, both to fully honor it. Once you have that in place again, and that's a very big if, then you can of course move on to have conversations about other issues. And of course, the Iranians have their own long list of complaints against the United States. So that's another aspect that people need to keep in mind. This is not going to be a conversation with one side responding to a long list of complaints from the other side. That's not the negotiation. That's a dressing down, as they say in the diplomatic world. And that's not something that the Iranians are going to subject themselves to voluntarily. Nor do DC have the clout to force Iran to such a conversation that will amount to a dressing down. Now, I'm not saying this because I think that's great or whatever. This is, this is about understanding and calibrating the difference that always exists between your own estimation of your strength and your estimation of your opponent. And there, I think the track record shows that the United States tends to overestimate its own influence and underestimate the resilience of the opposing party. And that's something that one needs to keep in mind as one of the lessons from the JCPOA, which unfortunately seem to be very easily forgotten now that they're, they're trying to basically repeat the success or at least salvage the previous success. Now, let's say that they manage to make the JCPOA work again. Both sides go back to it fully. And let's say that they have some kind of dividends, both sides, so they both feel compelled to continue honoring it. Then they will have a conversation about the, the issues that are difficult, among them, the ones that Kirsten mentioned. Now, as she also correctly pointed out, some of the things that in the media discourse and the political discourse in DC and Israel and in the Gulf are simply just a shorthand described as Iranians, Iran's malevolent activities are from the Iranian side considered at least partly to be very, very central to their security and deterrence doctrine. Among them, something that people in Israel, for instance, would recognize, strategic depth. A lot of the things that are portrayed in this particular way here, here being the West, are in Iran considered part of an attempt to create a strategic depth in order to offset the fact that Iran will never, ever be able to beat whether the United States nor Israel in anything that remotely looks like conventional warfare. So you have to then, out of that necessity, try and create some other kinds of strengths with a much smaller defense budget, which no matter how much money they put into it will never come anywhere near what their opponents have, 
in order to be able to show deterrence. And part of that is to make sure that whatever fights take place, take place elsewhere. That the fight with the United States and Israel in whatever shape and form it will take, will take place elsewhere in other countries. Now, of course, that means it's no fun being an Iraqi, having your country used as a playing field for the United States and Iran. Yes, but international politics is a cold place. And that is what the Iranians consider to be their way of making sure that the attacks do not take place in Iran itself. Whether they're successful, whether it's moral, etc. Those are things we can discuss. But in the end, this is not a moral calculation. It's not a lesson in ethics. It's about re being realistic about what you can salvage, what you can defend, and what means you have at your disposal to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Rosbe. I'm sure Kirsten will ha have something to say about that. So we'll come back to you later, but just let me go to Michael before I give you, I, 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 I go through uh, my own questions and then you will have a chance to respond if you want to. Uh, Michael, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Hanin, and uh, thank you, Simet, for inviting me. It's a pleasure uh, to be on this uh, event. Since this event is about Iran's regional operations, so I will focus on the relationship between what Iran is doing in the region and the nuclear talks. Uh, from Israeli perspective, the Iranian nuclear program is the most severe threat to Israel's national security. What Iran is doing in the region and uh, the development of uh, missiles, rockets and drones and so on is also considered a strategic uh, threat, but perhaps one degree lesser than the nuclear one. But uh, from Israeli point of view, uh, they are mutually reinforcing. They're all part of the same uh, strategy of power projection, uh, in, uh, inserting Iran in, in the region. Iran wants to build a kind of a nuclear umbrella for its proxies and to threaten its uh, enemies. And if Iran is ultimately legitimized as a nuclear threshold state, as may be the case with sunsets in 10, 15 years, then from Israeli perspective, this will destabilize the region because it will trigger a nuclear arms race in the region and inject a, a further instability. And along the way, if uh, funds are released, then the part of them will be used by Iran to bolster its uh, regional destabilizing activities as uh, they are seen from Israel, and not only from Israel, I think a lot in the, of people in the region uh, view it that way. <clears throat> now, from Israeli point of view, Israel is not in favor of including Iranian regional activities in the nuclear talks, and there are several reasons for that. The first is that, uh, uh, the way Israel regards it is that the nuclear issue is the most critical one and should not be overloaded with other issues. If you go for a grand bargain, all or nothing, you may end up with nothing. So this is the first consideration why they do not support it. And the second consideration is that um, they are concerned about uh, potential, potential trade-offs where Iran might give you something in the region and, and but take something in the nuclear and they don't want to be part of that uh, trade-off, which in certain, under certain circumstances could also uh, come at the expense of uh, Israel. By the way, the, the missiles are a category unto itself because missiles are the main delivery system for nuclear weapons, so they must be part of any nuclear uh, discussion and Israelis have been critical for the fact that this was not included in the JCPOA, it was only covered by a weak uh, UN Security Council resolution, resolution which is set to expire in 2023. So that does have to be uh, part of a discussion on how to block uh, Iranian pathways to a, a nuclear uh, weapon. The, uh, the Israeli criticism of Obama was not for not including the region in the nuclear deal. It was for giving Iran a pass uh, for fear of undermining the JCPOA to do what it pleases uh, in the region. The main point I want to emphasize is that in recent years, the, uh, the circle of friction between Israel and Iran uh, has exacerbated and, and expanded. For the first time, we see Israel and Iran trading direct blows. 
uh, with each other. It's not only run through its proxies, some of it is direct. And the circle of violence uh, and, and of friction between the two uh, expanded. It is in the nuclear uh, field itself with Iran expanding its nuclear uh, activities, including some unprecedented activities like enriching to 60% and enriching it for though and uh, limiting inspection, uh, the list is long. Uh, Israel reportedly, uh, according to uh, media reports, takes action against the Iranian nuclear program and Iran blames Israel and vows revenge. There's a lot of friction in Israel, first in the region, first and foremost in Syria, where Iran moved since 2016 uh, to build Syria as a formidable military front facing Israel, joining the one in Lebanon with uh, Hezbollah's over 100, uh, 130,000 projectiles aimed at Israel. And uh, from Israeli point of view, this was um, a, a, a serious strategic threat and Israel launched a campaign to thwart that. And it is not only about uh, strategic depth for Iran, 1500 kilometers away, it is also building a front facing Israel to threaten Israel. Uh, and that's why Israel launched that campaign and there's a lot of friction there. Uh, there's friction in Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah and the so-called precision project of Iran to equip Hezbollah with a sizable portion of uh, uh, high uh, accuracy uh, uh, rockets. Uh, again, uh, a strategic threat uh, from Israeli point of view. There is friction in other parts of the region. For example, the leaders of the Houthis in Yemen now say that they have a bank of Israeli targets and they could threaten Israel either directly or uh, uh, in the maritime sphere. There's Iranian support for uh, <coughs> armed groups in Gaza uh, and, and so on and so forth. We have seen exchange of blows in the cyberspace with Iran targeting uh, Israeli critical water infrastructure, they failed. Uh, and Israel, according to media reports, responding by, by striking an Iranian port. And now we hear reports about uh, friction in the maritime uh, sphere, where uh, according to media reports, Israel targeted some uh, Iranian ships uh, uh, moving to Syria and uh, Iran responded by hitting uh, Israeli-owned uh, ships in, in the Gulf of Oman. So what you see is uh, a lot of potential for escalation between Israel and Iran, even though both parties, I believe, do not want uh, to escalate to a major confrontation. But this could uh, definitely have an impact on uh, other negotiations uh, with Iran on the nuclear ones. The bottom line, I would say that uh, in addressing uh, the Iranian challenge, uh, one, I, I think regional actors, the United States and its European allies must design a comprehensive strategy. Nuclear talks should not be uh, something separated from a, a comprehensive strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, maybe the application would be differential between certain uh, regional and, and the nuclear and so on, but it should be a part of uh, the same strategy, employ all uh, available tools. I think that uh, if the United States uh, really wants to address it from a point of view of a comprehensive strategy, it should view what uh, some of the regional actors are doing as an asset in negotiations with Iran, like the Israeli campaign in Syria, like Israeli armed normalization. Uh, Iran is also, I'm not going to expand on it right now, but Iran is also has its own weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the region, uh, including in countries with large Shiite communities, like uh, maybe especially like Lebanon and Iraq, and we can discuss that, but we've seen a lot of protests against Iran in those countries like Lebanon, which is experiencing a, a total meltdown. And a lot of people are blaming Iran for that and Iranian proxies. <clears throat> and finally, I think uh, for that, you need uh, Iranian leader, uh, American leadership and, uh, to, and discussing it and working together with 
regional allies. Uh, the voice you hear from the region today sent to Washington and European capitals is, we are here, we are directly threatened by Iran. Whatever you do with them impacts us. We are stakeholders. You have to talk to us. We have to be part of this. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I will definitely uh, allow everyone to respond to their co-panelists. Uh, let me do that. But before, before I open the floor for you guys, I want to, I have my own questions and before we go to the Q&A. And I will, tell, I will ask them together and then I will have two minutes from each one of you to respond. One minute to me and one minute to each other, just to make sure that we have uh, uh, time for other for other questions, and we'll come back. So, Kirsten, you said in your talk uh, uh, that um, the U.S. wants to do to complete this deal to achieve a deal uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but I have a feeling that the Iranians are actually more in a hurry because of all the economic and financial uh, crises in, in 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 Iran, and also the fact that they can't really fund their proxies the way they used to be. So I have a feeling that uh, Iran is actually more cornered than the US and the US shouldn't be in a hurry. What's at stake really here for the US to be in a hurry the way you describe it? Don't, don't you think that they can actually uh, take their time and uh, 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 not rush this, especially that there are other priorities they're dealing with? Uh, I agree that the U.S. can take its time. Please go ahead, continue. I, I agree with you so far. I just don't yeah. think it's messaged at all. So perhaps it's been a strategic mistake by making it yeah. so clear in their language to Iran that they want mm -hmm. this fast. Yeah, because I, I still don't understand why would they want this fast. The Iranians want this fast, but it's, it's, it's just like we'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, Ruzmi, you said that Iran does not have the, the Iranians are really like coming with their own demands and with their own complaints and with their own, you know, like uh, set of, of uh, uh, ideas to go back to the original deal, right? And, and you said that this is not negotiable. But I think also there's a point here that I want you to highlight going back to the actual topic of the discussion, um, the regional the regional activities of, of Iran. It's, it's, it's in a way where the, if you look at the two parties at the table today, Again, back to the question I asked Kirsten, someone is in real hurry and they have a lot more at stake in these negotiations than the other party. So I'm not sure Iran really has the luxury to avoid these issues, the regional, the regional operations, knowing that any kind of deal that would relieve, uh, give some kind of financial relief to Iran is going to fund these operations. It's not going to fund the internal economy as much as it's going to fund these operations. So they, they need that more than the US and more than anyone else in the region. The countries that Iran today controls from Lebanon to Syria to Iraq is falling apart financially, economically, their proxies are suffering. So they really do not have the luxury of time really here. So realistically speaking, um, do you really have that? The, do, Let's say also that what happens, uh, what you said happens, right? That there is a, the same deal comes out and they feel that they have the uh, um, uh, enough financial and also uh, uh, diplomatic uh, freedom to do whatever they want in the region and fund operations the way they used to. How do you expect the Europeans, because you also, uh, I would like you to talk from that perspective as well, the Europeans and the US uh, to, to, to handle this, you know, like how, how, how did you go? You said that these issues will come after they go back to the deal. So how do they do that when the US loses this leverage? The negotiations at the end of the day is a leverage that the US has. When the US loses this leverage, how do they go about the uh, regional operations? It's, it's, uh, I still need to, um, would like you to elaborate a little bit on that. And Michael, um, Israel has been basically nonstop attacking Iran's regional infrastructure, mainly in Syria, but also a little bit in Lebanon and Iraq. But let's say the deal was reached, the same deal was reached, and nothing happens in terms of, you know, like, Iran's regional activities, the missiles, the precision missiles, etc. And this allows Iran to run free again in the region with more money, more uh, freedom. How would Israel react? Would it continue doing what they're doing? Would uh, Israel just expand these operations and actually go after the uh, precision missiles infrastructure in Lebanon as well? 
uh, is this going to be uh, the same feeling that Israel had earlier when they thought that we are on our own, we're going to do it on our own? Is this something that Israel would, would go for? Uh, what do you think? So, Kirsten? Sure. Thanks very much. I think you're right that the U.S. as a country doesn't necessarily need it, but the Biden administration needs it for both domestic reasons and international reasons because they messaged really clearly during the campaign that they would not have tolerance either of a nuclear Iran and that this would be their first and foremost priority in terms of the Middle East. And they made it clear that they expected that once they enter talks and would get and agreed to get back into the deal, Iran would jump back in and we'd be off and running. So by by these talks being elongated and the U.S. not reaching a deal, you run the risk that Iran continues to ramp up its program to the point that you hit a breakout threshold that looks that looks frighteningly dangerous to the U.S. Congress and to our partners like Israel, and that people start taking unilateral action and that Biden starts suffering domestically in Congress at home for not following through with what is a campaign promise. So they they really need this deal because they need to fulfill what they've been saying they expected to do. But as a country, yes, the U.S. can afford to sit and wait. Now, we do understand that Iran is um, running around a lot of the sanction and is, uh, sanctions and is actually exporting a lot more oil than, than, we, you know, than, than people are tracking and that they may not be in the desperate straits uh, people say they are. They're just choosing not to spend that money on social services for their population. The illicit trade folks can debate that all day long. But the point is that no one's going to make that decision except the Supreme Leader. But in the US, um, because they've been so much more vocal about their intent than Iran has, they've locked themselves in to a position where they really need to follow through. Um, do, do, do you want to take a minute to uh, respond to Ruzbe's uh, question or do you want to leave that to later? I mean, I'll, I'll just say really quickly that I think I think you raised a great point, Ruzbe, about, you know, if a new, US, a new U.S. president is elected, is it possible that the U.S. could leave the deal? And it's true that a future U.S. president could choose to leave the deal as any other country can. But the international community should not look to the US and ask, how do we know you won't leave again? They should instead look to Iran and ask, why do you continue to attack, threaten, and strong arm other countries in the region and the partners they invite into their territory to the point that they have to beg the US to help them protect their sovereignty, leading the US to then leave as one mechanism that's non-kinetic for doing that. So why is the impetus on the US not to leave instead of Iran, not to continue the activities that then create the impetus for leaving to begin with. I think the theory that leaving the deal plus maximum economic pressure would create the conditions for a more expansive deal has been proven false. So I think it's more likely that a future president would only leave the deal if there was proof of nuclear non-compliance. Okay, wonderful. Rose Thank you. I mean, it's always uh, invigorating to have non-consensus on a panel. So, so let me then continue going in, in a totally different direction. I, I think fundamentally disagree both with Kirsten and with you, honey. Uh, and let me let me try and explain why. First of all, let's let's do a check of the history writing of the last four months, four, four to five months. It was the United States that almost managed to screw the whole thing up about coming back to the deal by spending the first couple of months pontificating about what else they were supposed to get from Iran in order for them to go back. So the United States began again with the general assumption that the Iranians would fall over themselves in gratitude for the United States coming back to the deal. So the question was, what else can we wring out of the Iranians before the United States goes back to the deal? And what happened, quite predictably, at least if you have a, some, you know, inkling, you know, some idea of what's going on in Tehran is that the Iranians said, no, we are not falling over ourselves. Now, it could be that the Iranians are overestimating their own ability to be resilient. That's perfectly possible and quite likely. They're not particularly good at governance. But the point is that on this particular issue, they do have some kind of consensus within their security establishment and also within the political elite. So they did not fall over themselves. They said, you want to come back? You come back first, and then we can talk about everything else. So we wasted, or rather the Biden administration wasted a number of precious months before they figured out that for any of this to move forward, they were going to have to eat a bit of humble pie and come back and sit down like everyone else. And more importantly, as the one single party that's actually left the deal. 
Now, who is, who is in a hurry? No one is in a hurry because everyone pretends like the schoolyard kids that they are, that this is a game of leverage. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why international politics looks as bad as it does. This whole obsession with leverage. So we can play this game like those trade sanctions people all day. The Iranians will say, well, I mean, our position is not dependent on a particular government. Our position is based on elite consensus. So presidential election or no presidential election, our position is pretty clear. And it will be the same also on June 19th, the day after the presidential elections, will be the same in August and September when the new president comes into office. So in that sense, the Iranians could also, of course, claim that they're not in a hurry. And they're also not in a hurry because, yes, their economic system is very much in dire straits, but it's been in dire straits for quite some time. And throughout this whole maximum pressure that the Trump administration added, and Mike Pompeo ran around bragging about how many billions of dollars he had managed to, to kind of not allow the Iranians to get a hold of, all of these regional activities that you are now in a sense, saying is the main problem, all of those things were happening anyways. Now, this brings us to another kind of conceptual fallacy in this conversation, which is that the countries of Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq are masterminded by proxies to Iran, and therefore there's a direct proportional relation between how much money Tehran has, how much money it doles out, and the ability of those supposed proxies to hold power. Well, the point here is that if you look at Lebanon, for instance, you, we can have all kinds of conversations about Hezbollah and what it's like and what it's not, et cetera, et cetera. But Hezbollah also has a domestic constituency in Lebanon. Hezbollah does not exist, fall, or stand simply with Iranian support. That doesn't mean that they're popular everywhere in Lebanon. It doesn't mean that the money they get from Iran is irrelevant to them. It's not. It is quite relevant. But it's also not that you can say that because we sanction Iran, they have less money, then suddenly Hezbollah would disappear. It is also not the case that if, if there is a return to the deal, that all the money that Iran gets is going to go to Hezbollah. I mean, we have to be a bit consistent. Either the economic pressure that the United States has applied on Iran has led to economic dire straits for Iran, or it hasn't. If it has, most likely some of that money that they're going to get is going to go to kind of refurbish a country that is on the downward spiral. It's not all going to go to Hezbollah. They're not going to survive by having Hezbollah working out with limousines. They're going to survive by their ability to maintain control of Iranian society. So, I mean, somewhere we have to be a bit reasonable about what we are talking about. There is another complication here, and that is the fact that even if everyone went back to the original deal, that doesn't mean that suddenly Iran has was, you know, vast oceans of money at their disposal, because what we're talking about is first removing sanctions, secondary sanctions, and more importantly, to grow some trust in the business communities of the countries who used to do business with Iran to dare go back. And that's where the trust or lack of trust for U.S. government positions and its consistency becomes important. No company in the world with a return on investment that takes two years or three years, which is to make a major investment in Iran, is going to do that simply because the United States decided to go back to the deal. They will need to see some more long-term commitment and that the Biden administration is going to be consistent in that. Now, finally, to Kirsten's point about why the onus should be on the US and not on Iran. Well, it might seem like pontificating from a loyalty perspective, but the point here is that the JCPOA is an agreement with the UN Security Council's permanent members and Germany. That means that the Russians and the Chinese and everyone else is also in it. It's not a US-Iranian deal. And the reason why it succeeded was exactly the things that people complain about. It succeeded because they compartmentalized this single issue, which all the members of the Security Council could agree on, was of dire threat to international peace, the Iranian nuclear program. And the point was to box that in and make it as strictly controlled and surveilled as possible through negotiations. If you had had a general agreement, well, then the US could have complained about what the Russians were doing in Crimea and whatnot. None of those things were part of the negotiation. Everything else, all other complaints everyone had about everyone were checked at the door. And that's the reason they could reach this agreement.
And the point of it being, of course, that once that was established and if it worked, then you could perhaps move on okay. to other things. But we uh, didn't. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Rose Bay. I, I really have to uh, interrupt you because we have so many questions, I'm sure, because it's such an interesting discussion. We are getting a lot of questions. I want to make sure that we give chance to the audience to ask. So I'm going to be cutting off people who go beyond, you know, like the time limit. I'm really sorry, but I think uh, your point has, has uh, we all we all heard your point. Uh, Michael, very briefly, if we can respond to this question. Yes, uh, very <laughs> briefly. If the United States and Iran go back to the JCPOA and Iran continues to operate the way it does in Syria, then uh, Israel will likely continue its campaign against the Iranian entrenchment in Syria. Let me emphasize, emphasize this is a campaign against the Iranian military entrenchment in Syria, not against other types of activities there. And it is focused on the most uh, strategic elements of it, like the precision project and so on. The Iranian designs, including uh, deploying uh, tens of thousands of uh, proxies in Syria, tens of thousands of uh, rockets aimed at Israel and so on and so forth. So that will continue. Israel never accepted that the nuclear deal should legitimize uh, or uh, provide Iran with any immunity in the region and uh, it will continue. All right, thank you very much. Um... Just to remind everyone that if you have, if you want to ask the questions to our panelists, just put it in the Q and A, and don't forget to mention your name and country. And I will take your questions from the Q and A and ask. Uh, the, but because we have uh, limited time, so I'm going to take uh, three questions at a time, and I would like to ask the panelists to be very, very, very brief because we have more than ten. We have twelve questions so far. So let me start with um, Jasser Tahat in Jordan Institute of Statecraft. Uh, Dr. Parsi spoke about the loss of trust between Iran and the US and whether agreements are easily re, um, uh, re reneged by the US. I would like to ask whether this lack of trust would allow for the other international powers such as Russia and China to impose and formulate a non-proliferation policy and dynamic in the Middle East. Uh, we also have a question from, from Shahram as Moody in the US. Why do US policymakers constantly disregard Iran's threat perception and the US role in fostering mischief in the region? I think we kind of uh, uh, addressed that, but I think this is more for, for Kirsten. Dr. Seema uh, Kalai Koglu, I hope this this is spelled it right, from Istanbul, Turkey. During the Trump era, the IAEA was almost completely pushed aside. It is as the nuclear watchdog going to, res is the nuclear watch watchdog going to resume its active role in the process of verification for the Jitoba, uh, uh, GCPOA or, or if, if ever reinitiated? Um, um, I will continue the rest of the questions when you just respond to these, please, as briefly as possible. Thank you. Kirsten. Can you, can you repeat that question? Was she asking why does the US administration continue to ignore Iran's regional behaviors? Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Is that on your end or mine end, Tanin? Sorry. I was no. on mute. Uh, Easy the question is, I think, why they do the US policymakers constantly disregard Iran's threat perception and the US role in fostering mischief in the region? They're always talking about Iran's regional operations. I think their question is that, what about US regional operations? Got it. No, that makes, that's, I think it's a great question. Um, actually, one of my favorite cartoons, um, political cartoons from this past, in you know, the past few years, was. Um, was a bunch of you know American generals theoretically sitting around a map and looking at a map of U.S. military bases around the region, around, you know, located around Iran, and saying like, you know, we don't understand why do they think we're a threat or you know what why why did they set up their country in the middle of our bases? It was something like that. You know, it was kind of funny. Um, these bases have not threatened Iran. There's never actually been an active threat from American bases on Iranian territory or Iranian interests. You know, the U.S. has continued to react to attacks on its people and its partners conducted by Iran's uh, partners themselves 
But these bases have never had a, a role in conducting active military operations against Iran. In fact, it protects shipping lanes. Many of them protect shipping lanes through which Iranian oil flows when it's on the market. So if anything, Iran should be grateful for the US presence because it does reduce conflicts often and it has protected their economic interests when Iran is sort of a part of the larger licit international community. Um, that's not to say that, that Iran should, should be grateful. It's not that. It's just that they shouldn't have perceived a threat. And so I think it's them trying to twist the fact that someone's there wearing combat boots um, into a threat in order to create a narrative that allows them to convince their population that they need to continue funding for activities against those bases. Okay, thank you. And thanks for being brief, please, as brief as possible. I'm getting so many questions, so please go ahead, uh, uh, Ruzbe. Thank you. Um... Perhaps we need to have a special session where Kirsten and I can kind of hash this out. Um, let me just then briefly address these two issues of Russia, China, and Trump IEA. I think the Russian and the Chinese are quite happy with the non-proliferation regime that exists. I mean, one of the reasons that they also have tried in their own roundabout way to push Iran during the negotiations in Vienna last time around was, of course, because they are not interested in Iran having nuclear weapons any more than anyone else is. They are, however, perhaps more Machiavellian, if you will, or more pragmatic in using the negotiations as a way of making sure the United States and Iran don't get too cozy with one another, because it is useful sometimes for Moscow to be able to play the Iranian card vis-a-vis -vis Washington, for instance, at least has been uh, in the recent 10 years or so. So I, in that sense, I don't think they're necessarily out to, to create a new one or even have the ambition they're not interested in spending that amount of energy and political capital to kind of create in some new regime. They are part of the one that exists and to some degree they have been helpful with that, uh, but that doesn't mean that they align fully with the United States when it comes to everything else because they have their own national interest. We can, you know, that's the way it is. IEA was relevant throughout the Trump era. It's just that the Trump administration didn't want to listen to the IEA. Uh, and I think, of course, the United States being, you know, one of the biggest countries, hegemon, blah, 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 sure. But the fact remains that the IEA is a UN organization which everyone else subscribes to, including Israel. So it's not that everyone else thought it was irrelevant that the IEA did go and still goes to Iran and inspects the nuclear facilities. And up until the Iranians started with their own less for less thing uh, 18 months ago or so, uh, they could show that Iran was in full compliance with its obligations. The crisis we have at the moment, speaking previously about who is in a hurry, is of course that the Iranians have said that, you know, the next step in the less for less would be to kick out the inspectors unless the Americans kind of make sure and to show that they are serious about coming back to the agreement. That's when the IEA director general had to fly to Tehran and try and kind of mend the fences a bit and come up with some interim agreement that allowed the IEA to continue its inspections so that no one would be scared or scaremonger that Iranians are now suddenly going to enrich and, and create a nuclear bomb. And that agreement expires on the 21st of this month. So in that sense, everyone is in a hurry, at least if they want to keep the little that is left of the JCPOA in order to be able to solve and salvage it long term. Thank you. Yes, Michael, your turn. Uh, two brief points on the questions. Uh, I, as regards Russia, I just want to mention uh, what came up in the in the leaked uh, recording of uh, Mohammad Jawad Zarif, according to which in 2015, uh, Qasem Soleimani convinced Russia to try and undermine the deal for fear that the United States and Iran will get close to each other. So I just want to remind ourselves about the Russian interest here. I'm not sure I would uh, you know, go all the way relying on them uh, to broker something. Uh, on the IAEA, I think this is a very important point because while the IAEA is not a party to the JCPOA, it is in charge of uh, monitoring, inspection, verification, under the NPT and Iranian uh, the agree safeguards agreement between Iran and the IAEA. But I think what happened is that uh, while Iran can claim that it complied with the JCPOA, it cannot claim that it complied with the safeguards agreement because what we've seen in the nuclear archives are sites and activities which are undeclared by Iran. They are suspicious of military dimensions 
and the IAEA itself says that there's no technical credibility to the Iranian explanations to uh, what was found there. So I think uh, this should be part of a new deal. Uh, the baseline shifted, and if you want to uh, create a new, go back to the deal, it has to address open issues between the IAEA and Iran, and there are serious open issues. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, many questions, so I'm going to go three at a time each time. So uh, now we have uh, a couple of questions from uh, Jack uh, Werner. He's a Dutch diplomat in Iran. He's asking if Vienna is only about U.S. return to GCPOA, how and when should the snapback, uh, IR demand, and the sunset clauses, U.S.-EU demand, uh, be dealt with? Also, how does Israel feel about the direct Iran KSA talks in Baghdad and what opportunities and risks there are for Tel Aviv? Uh, the third question is from Nikolai Surkov. Uh, in Russia, Iran is not a threat to the US or Europe. Why should they spend resources on containing Iran? Isn't it cheaper to recognize the larger regional role of Iran and respect its interests? Uh, there's another question from Jack Werner also uh, um, uh, to, to, to Ruzbe. Uh, about the last four months, Iran's welcomed the election of Biden with an unprovoked December anti-faction nuclear law initiated by hardline parliament that set of a jump to a 60% uranium enrichment. Was that uh, a useful gesture? Um, so, okay, let's let's go for another round. I think, Rusby, if you want to respond uh, to this question, then we take, uh, then we go Michael and Kirsten to give her a break. Go ahead, Rusby. Thank you. Um, well, regarding this sun, sunset clauses and the snapback and, and that whole thing, I mean, you can you can look at it this way. Uh, first of all, the sunset clause, clauses are not going to uh, liberate Iran from all kinds of constraints. I mean, that's simply not true. Iran is still going to have to honor and sign and ratify and stick to the additional protocol. Uh, so it's not like just because this, the sunset clause is activated, so to speak, then there's a get, get out of uh, free get out of jail card for Iran in any shape or form. But at some point, of course, you, you cannot expect the country to negotiate an agreement which put on it a permanent onus, a permanent constriction that no one else lives under. You know, how, how do you enforce that in a negotiation? I mean, that's pretty unrealistic. And that's also the reason why they didn't manage to enforce anything like that back in 2015. Uh, and I doubt very much they would try or, or be successful with that now. Snapback, same thing. You see, snapback requires that you are not only a signatory, but an active member of the agreement. And that is what the United Nations did last, last year when, when the Trump administration tried, in a sense, to trick itself back into being able to activate snapback. And everyone else pretended that the U.S. wasn't in the room because they believed that the U.S. did not have a legal leg to stand on because it had left the deal. So that, in turn, is one of the reasons why the Iranians are a bit cautious about the return of the United States, because, of course, once the United States is back in the deal, then, of course, it legally has the right to activate snapback. But snapback is not something that you can activate just by snapping with your fingers. You have to go through the process of being able to convince, in one way or another, the other signatories that something systemically is wrong here. Uh, and, you know, so that's that's something that still needs to, to kind of be panned out. And if both parties come back to it and the IEA can confirm that Iran is sticking to its obligations, then there is no need for snapback. The Majlis decision on 60% was incredibly stupid. Absolutely. But of course, in the same way that we can talk about and diagnose the domestic politics of D.C. and why U.S. Congress behaves the way it does and why the Biden administration has to play play with them and try and navigate it between the minefields that Menendez and others put out there in the name of a better deal, you have the same kind of game in Tehran, of course. The hardliners who were against the deal to begin with are, are you know, they were very happy with Trump. And even the supreme leader could, sh could, you know, show that for once he was right about the United States, like a 
clock that doesn't work at least twice per day, it's right. Uh, and so they are kind of leveraging that in order to be able to say, well, now we have to you know, push back against the Americans, blah, blah, blah. So that's part of the domestic politics. It's not helpful at all. But you know, uh, if, we, if we have to take American domestic politics into account to understand why US foreign policy looks the way it does, we have to do that for Iran as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Michael. Uh, two points, one on sunsets and the other on uh, Iranian-Saudi uh, talks. Uh, on sunsets, uh, I agree that uh, it's going to be extremely difficult to move the Iranians toward a longer deal uh, once the parties go back into compliance. But I want to set the record straight about the meaning of sunsets. The meaning of sunsets is that within 10 to 15 years, most limitations on the Iranian nuclear program will be lifted. Iran will be allowed to enrich on an industrial scale to higher degrees than uh, low enrichment using uh, the most sophisticated centrifuges. And this means that breakout time will shrink to nothing and we, Iran will ultimately be legitimized as a nuclear threshold state. In such a situation, uh, Iranian commitments under the safeguards agreement or the additional protocol uh, doesn't mean a lot. And I think as I explained, uh, such a situation is unbearable to Israel and some other actors in the region. It will trigger a nuclear arm ra arms race. Uh, it will inject uh, a lot of instability into the region. So we have to be very clear eyed about this. Uh, on the Iranian-Saudi talks, I would say that uh, people here in Israel first don't believe that much will come out of it uh, because uh, there is very deep uh, mistrust between uh, these two actors and just talking to each other is not going to fix that. The Saudis are extremely concerned about Iranian activities in the region and the nuclear program. The interpretation I hear uh, from people here in government circles is that uh, the very fact that they, the, the Saudis are talking to the Iranians are because they are not sure that the United States will ultimately produce a, a good deal or a stabilizing situation by talking to the Iranians. So they keep all options open. Thank you, Michael. Uh... Last, uh, before we go to the next round of uh, questions, Kirsten, you want to say something? Sure, there was a, a, I thought a really fun, pretty good question on, you know, uh, from, from our colleague in Russia about if Iran is not a threat to the US or Europe, then why should we spend resources on containing Iran? And I think that goes back to the question of what each country's national interests are in the region. And, you know, we, those, that's, that's, room for a thesis there. But the main reasons that the U.S. Is, is invested in this is because U.S. partners in Iran have been attacked and destabilized continually, and they have asked for help. And I mean, sure, Russia can understand that from the perspective of their Syria intervention. Sorry, then, you mean U.S. partners in the region, not in Iran? Sorry, yes, yes, yes. U.S. partners in the region, exactly, are have, have been attacked and destabilized, and they are the ones who have asked the U.S. for help continually and repeatedly. And it's part of the reason that, we're, that we've been there at all. And it's part of the reason the region is so upset that the U.S. is, is looking into additional withdrawals right now. And then there's the issue of global shipping and the issue of the U.S. economy. And, you know, we like to think of shipping as this sort of old school way of transport, but that's really something like 60 percent or more of the world shipping still goes through the three straits that are in the Middle East of the of the five that really are the chokeholds of, of trade within the within the you know the global map. So the U.S. is really invested in trying to protect world trade as a free market economy. It's really part of our identity, and the the idea that Iran, if it was an adversary to the U.S. with the means, could shut down big portions of the world economy at whim if they controlled those straits is another reason that the U.S. is is there again, not to do anything um, kinetically against Iran and not to do anything that would limit Iran's use of those, but to ensure that the globe has the use of those. And then of course, there's the, there's the you know, when you get into second and third order effects, the Iranian violent, you know, backed violent groups that are in countries in the region feed the recruitment narrative extremist groups and it helps them to fundraise. And these groups have aspirations to kill Americans and have, and they institute religious codes and in societies with lots and lots of American citizens, lots and lots of dual nationals. 
And uh, so the US thinks that making Iran a pro-social versus an anti-social member of the neighborhood would in fact make America safer. There are lots and lots of reasons. I just gave those three as kind of tier one, tier two, tier three considerations, but that's why the US is, is invested. Excellent, thank you. So next round of questions. Uh, we have a question from Thomas Brunden, Embassy of Sweden in Tehran. Uh, he's asking uh, whether Iran will meet the new positive tone we hear from the KSA and contribute to the regional de-escalation and normalization, which now seems more likely with the Biden administration. And we have a question from Chris Bidwell from in the US uh, saying that the IMF reported that Iran had $123 billion in foreign currency reserves in 2018 and is down to 4 billion today. Does this suggest Iran is in fact getting desperate for relief? Uh, third question uh, from Karen Gat Rutter, European Union. Can Afghanistan be an area where the US and Iran see eye to eye or even cooperate? The US troops are withdrawing, which rhymes well with Tehran's desire to remove foreign forces from their neighborhood. Both countries are also worried about the stability of Afghanistan. We still have more questions, but I'm going to take these three and ask you uh, to, to, to respond, uh, um, Rosbe. Thank you. Um, well, on, on the Riyadh Tehran talks, um, I hope they are ongoing. I hope they can lead to something. And I think the less we hear about them, the better. Exactly, because this is a very, very sensitive and touchy topic for both parties to kind of stand down and talk to each other. Uh, and I think it, as, as Michael said, I mean, th this is not going to be a meeting of minds or hearts or anything like that. It's partly, at least from the Saudi side, uh, the recognition that the Biden administration does not automatically come running to its defense, no matter what happens in the same way that Trump did, at least not in that kind of overt and offensive way that the Saudis were kind of indulging it a bit in when, when Trump was around. And so they need to kind of come to have some kind of direct interactions with the Iranians themselves. Because the point here, and this is not optimism, because that's difficult in this region to have. But one of the reasons why one would like to think that inevitably these countries have to figure something out, and that goes for Iran, Israel as well, for that matter, is that they are neighbors. And there's no way they're going to get away from each other. Neither of them is going to disappear, and they're all going to be there. And so they need to figure something out. Of course, politics isn't that rational, and politicians are not necessarily that smart. So, you know, that happening is going to take quite a bit of tango, and this is just the beginning. Hopefully, it will lead to something, but it's too early to tell. Afghanistan, yes and no. Again, you can say that the Iranians have had to adopt a much more pragmatic attitude vis a vis the Taliban, for instance than the United States had to some degree, for the simple reason that the US, at least theoretically, wanted to leave at some point and now literally is going to leave. The Iranians are not going to be able to leave. Afghanistan is part of their near area. They have economic interests, they have political interests, and they have also an interest that Afghanistan does not become even more unstable than it is. And Iran being a much smaller, much less developed, much poorer country than the US, if the US cannot beat the Taliban, Iran cannot beat the Taliban. And since the Taliban is going to be there for the foreseeable future, you have to have some kind of modus vivendi with them. You have to at least have some channels open to them and figure out just how far are they going to go uh, and what is, what is their role, so to speak, in the future of Afghanistan. So Iran has had a kind of a schizophrenic approach to the US. On the one hand, Iran always complains about the US in the region. And there I would again disagree a bit with Kirsten. Uh, there have been successive US governments which have had regime change as part of their public and official policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So it's not as simple as saying that whatever uh, you know, military bases the US has could not be perceived as a threat to Iran. Now, whether they are actually meant that way or not is a different issue, but it's not taken out of thin air from the Iranian point of view of being threatened by those bases. So on the one hand, Iran has complained about the presence of, of the US. On the other hand, they, are, they were happy when the US was bogged down in Iraq rather than being able to attack Iran. And to some degree, they fear the US withdrawing because they cannot fill those shoes when it comes to trying to finance some kind of stabilization, whether in Iraq nor in Afghanistan. 
So we'll see where it goes. And there could be some meeting of minds. There was when both attacked Taliban after 9-11. Uh, but Iran cannot afford the kind of uh, operations that the U.S. Have, have had. And so they are going to have to deal with whoever ends up running Afghanistan. Um, finally, very quickly, on the foreign currency reserves, yes, Iran's economy have, has tanked, partly due to the maximum pressure. But again, there is no direct proportion between Iran's economy and its ability to be resilient to U.S. pressure in terms of politics. They have not... Uh, cut their nuclear program. They have not cut their support to their regional allies. So just the fact that they have low foreign, foreign currency reserves does not mean that they're going to fold. That's the bottom line. On that, uh, Ruzbe, just like a small follow-up question on that. If um, How can they continue support for the regional uh, proxies uh, without access to hard currency? Well, Everything I mean, they, they like all the support is is about, you know, it's not just money. It's also weapons. It's everything needs hard currency. So how they're going to do that? Well, I mean, that's a kind of a methodological question, and and so my my if you will question is to question a bit the whole premise that Iran is spending as much money as people think that they are on their proxies, as they are called, or and also that those proxies are so dependent on Iranian money to be able to do whatever it is that they're doing. Because if they were, to the extent that people think or suspect, a lot of them should have shrunk by now. And they have not. In fact, yeah. during maximum, they, well, during maximum pressure, uh, which would be the high, high time, so to speak, of, of, of uh, forcing Iran's economy into, into the red, so to speak, Iran managed to maintain and be quite offensive which from their point of view is about creating deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the US. So I'm not saying that the money doesn't matter. I'm just saying that there's no direct proportion between influence and ability and money. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, my, uh, Ruzbe, uh, sorry, Michael or, or Kirsten, who wants to respond to the rest of the questions? Kirsten? I can take the, the question about the tone from Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, whether or not we expect Iran to respond positively to the new positive tone from Saudi that I believe came from our Swedish colleague um, living in Iran. And I think I think we have lots of indications that Iran will. One, we saw the hope proposal that was floated at UNGA in 2019. Two, we've seen Iranian reps about six months ago go to Kuwait and essentially ask Kuwait, would you be willing to be a, a facilitator of discussions on, on these topics? Three, we know that there have been ongoing talks quietly with the UAE, and we'll see another round of those in a week or so, you know, just exchange of intelligence leads and the like. And then, in my opinion, I think Iran is actually pressing for a detente with Saudi. I think the ramp up of attacks we've seen against Saudi Arabia from the Houthis in just these few recent months is a message from Iran to Saudi that you can't rely on the US to keep your citizens safe, so you need to deal directly with us. So I think there, is a, there are several indications that Iran would would latch on to and accept any sort of olive branch from Saudi Arabia. That's not to say the discussions would be easier, that they wouldn't get stuck on technical points, but I think they'd definitely be open to it and happy about it. Michael, do you want to, get, do you want to say something? I'll just say one point about uh, Iranian funding for proxies. Um, I'm not going to debate the question who is an Iranian proxy or not, but uh, there's no doubt that Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy, um, that uh, their leadership subscribes to Wilayat al-Faqih, the, this theory of, of the rule of the jurist. Uh, and Nasrallah himself said, we get everything from Iran, weapons, money, everything. And, and the fact of the matter is that uh, most funding for Hezbollah came from Iran. And according to uh, what I consider credible intelligence reports, before uh, US sanctions on Iran, that financial support amounted to close to $1 billion a year. It's a lot of money. And following that pressure, uh, it was cut by about 40%. This is also very significant. So I would not underestimate the impact. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, that I think that uh, the, uh, the uh, strategy of maximum pressure yielded uh, the results that Trump wanted it to yield. I don't think so. 
but in, but in terms of applying pressure on Iran and through that applying pressure, even if it doesn't translate one to one on Iranian ability to inject funding to its proxies in the region, it did have an impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to the uh, next round of questions. Uh, uh, the last three, I think, which is great because that's we still have uh, exactly uh, uh, 20 minutes. So that would be great. Uh, so I will ask these three questions, ask you to respond, and then we go to the closing remarks. And uh, unless we get like another question, we have time. So the next one is from Umut Koldas for Near East Institute in North Cyprus. Do the US and its allies have a well-designed strategy to include the regional actors, particularly the Gulf countries in comprehensive deal and negotiations with Iran. Then we have a question from Antonia Dimo uh, from Greece. A bipartisan group of more than 40 senators, including the top Democrat and top Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, recently sent a letter to the American president urging him to address issues beyond Tehran's nuclear program. I think, Kirsten, you mentioned that in your, in your talk. Uh, to consult with Israel and other U.S. allies as Washington negotiates with Iran. How feasible is it for the Biden administration to go for a broader deal that will demand that Iran limits its ballistic missiles program support for terrorist groups and other malign activities? I think this is the topic of the whole discussion, but probably if you have like anything specific to add to, add to that. Uh, third question is from Huda Awad from Egypt. And Huda, happy birthday. Uh, I do agree with Dr. Ruth Bay on the game of leverage, but the sanctions put over Iran are deteriorating the economy and Iranians are living in a very bad situation. They need to get out, but the only power they have is, to, is the nuclear power. So what do they do now? Uh, okay, uh, Kirsten, you wanna, you wanna answer? Uh, take your time, uh, take your, your, your minute to answer. Sure. Um, in terms of a strategy for including the Gulf allies in negotiations, the, the Biden team has made it clear that they will consult and they have consulted. And you're seeing this week, we've got a team, an interagency team, DOD, NSC, and State Department out in the region, in the Gulf, and then in Jordan also, and in Egypt, um, talking about all kinds of things in the region, but this is one of them. And then they've also sent out specific people. Brett McGirt went out very early to talk about these kinds of things. And then they've, they've assigned a, a special envoy for Yemen and showing that they're serious about making sure that some of the issues that have been sticks, you know, sticky, getting in the way of this process going forward are going to be dealt with in their own lanes and taken very seriously. So the Biden administration is definitely trying to show the Gulf that we're listening this time. We're not going to make the mistakes you've told us our predecessors in the Obama administration made when um, developing the first JCPOA. So, and, but that's not to say that the Gulf will necessarily get a vote. You know, these consultations make sure that, that the team is tracking what the, what the issues are, but it doesn't mean that they get to tell the U.S. how to, um, how to come down in a, final, in, you know, in a final deal. So some of the things, I believe that's exactly why we're seeing some of these ramp ups in Iranian backed activity against Gulf interests, because Iran understands that this is the U.S.'s position and is then trying to tell the Gulf, you've got, just like the US is trying to talk to us directly, you need to talk to us directly. Iran wants more bilateral conversations like this because it can protect its interests better that way than if it goes, that if it faces this multilateral panel of US and Gulf and European interests, you know, it, it wants to go one-on-one -on -one and kind of make its case with, with each of these groups. So the, the US strategy is about consultation, but to your point, it's not necessarily about putting them at the table in the conversations with Iran. We've heard one rumor of a meeting that may have taken place with the US, Iranian, and Saudi representative in the room, um, but that would that would be sort of one, one meeting on one topic, and that would not necessarily mean that what was said would become written into any specific deal. I think the, the pressure remains on. The Gulf is still making it clear to the US, we need to see evidence that you're taking us into consideration. If that doesn't mean that your new deal addresses the proxies and the missiles, it means that we need to see evidence that you're doing other things to protect us, you're taking other steps to protect us, or that you have a way to incentivize or pressure Iran to enter into negotiations on a second deal about those activities. Because if you're just doing nuclear and nothing else, you're still leaving us high and dry. 
And the, the Biden administration is sincere about saying, we don't want to do that. We're really listening and we're trying to come up with answers, but they don't have those answers yet. Just a follow up question on this. Um, what do you think uh, the answer could be, you know, in the sense that if the deal is going to happen without, you know, having any kind of uh, nuclear activity or missiles or anything on in, in, inside the deal itself, and but the pressure remains, you say the pressure remains and, and the issue remains and Iran is not going to withdraw from the region or even, you know, like uh, accept containment, as, as, as uh, Ruzbe uh, rightly said. So, Beyond the deal, like really, let's forget about the deal. The deal is done, things happen, and, and the, the region is still ongoing, the escalation is still ongoing. What can the US do in that sense? You know, like, and I'd like others also to respond, but you, Kirsten, for specifically since you mentioned it, just to follow up on that. What, 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 ne what are these next steps? Uh, what could be done? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd do if I were in the seat would be to publicize, put into the deal itself, a clause that says that if Iran does not come to an agreement on regional activities within X period, a year, two years, three years, um, that sanctions will snap back. Understanding that Iran probably would not accept that clause, but I would highly publicize to the international community, we've asked them just for this, just to ensure that it, within this time period, we've arrived at some sort of deal, not just being at the table, because that is Iran's sweet spot, sweet spot, you know, these protracted, prolonged negotiation talks where they don't have to actually do anything. No, you need to be at a deal on these activities within X period of time or sanctions snap back. When Iran says no, the international community then needs to ask them, why not? Why won't you engage in these conversations? And we, we're going to put much more of a spotlight on what your activities are, and we need you to engage with us on what you'd be willing to do. You know, what can incentivize you, Iran? And I'd be asking Iran's partners, what are they looking for? You know, how do we make them secure enough, feel secure enough that they don't need these activities? For instance, you know, the, the, the U.S. talking about drawing down from some, of our, from some of our military bases in the region, the reason we're there half the time is because of Iran's activities. We might have been out of Iraq already under President Trump if the PMFs and the PMUs were not attacking U.S. and Iraqi military bases. We might not be involved in the coalition if it, that was in Saudi Arabia, if the Houthis were not still attacking our partner, Saudi Arabia. So there's sort of, you, you have to wonder what, what are in Iran's motives here if they say they want the US out of the region militarily because they feel it is a threat, but then their own actions are what's keeping it there as a deterrent and as a, a security guarantee for our partners. Um, so I think we'd have to, we'd need to look to some folks who really know them well and say, what are they, what are they actually looking for? Let's, let's get Iran to be very, very, very sincere about, um, what they're looking for, because our, our assumption is that they're not actually looking for any of this to happen, that they need the U.S. to remain a threat so that they can maintain their domestic narrative about we are always under threat, we are always under assault, and therefore we have to be vigilant, and therefore we need to spend money on proxy programs and on missiles and on a nuclear program and all of these things that suck away from the social services you, our population, are demanding. So I think it would be interesting to have, um, to, to require Iran to answer some pretty tough questions about their actual motives and intent. And I don't think you can get anywhere until you understand that. And if it's true that their only motive really is regime survival, then you're in a tough spot because there's nothing that can be done. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Michael? Well, to answer the question about uh, you know, the regional role in talking to Iran, I would say that the feeling here in Israel, and this is the feeling I hear also uh, from talking to uh, colleagues in the region, is that uh, the Biden administration, unlike uh, the Obama administration, um, talks to us, uh, carries a dialogue, listens. Uh, then the, the, then the, there was a dialogue, but there was a feeling that they don't really listen, that they don't really, they're not really interested. They did a lot of things behind our back. That's not the feeling you get uh, these days. Uh, there are talks. We had now a meeting of the two national security advisors of Israel and the United States in uh, Washington, DC. As uh, Kirsten mentioned, there, is, uh, there are several American delegations uh, going around the region now, talking to the Arab Quartet about this and so on. So uh, at the same time, I agree that uh, we don't have a veto power over, over anything. They make their own decisions. 
there's a lot of suspicion in the region about a potential outcome. And uh, people are saying, you know, uh, whatever you decide will have a direct impact on us ultimately. So we will have to take our decisions if uh, the outcome doesn't really guarantee stability and it may not guarantee stability. You may reach, uh, you may have the parties go back to the nuclear deal, but that will probably not stabilize the region. And that problem will continue and follow us and we'll have to take uh, measures there as well. And one other point I want to make is that uh, uh, the, the general feeling here in the region for, uh, you know, on the side of those who don't trust Iran is that if you really want diplomacy to work with Iran, you need uh, not only incentives, but also disincentives and the right mix of incentives and disincentives. And it doesn't make sense that while Iran talks to the United States, it allows itself to do all sorts of things in the nuclear field, in the region, in violent activities and uh, others should be excluded from uh, using the same tools as the Iranians do. Thank you. We, we got uh, three more questions. So I think we have time if you would like to answer briefly and conclude uh, your remarks. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Ruzbek, of course. You, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, there are several things here. I think, first of all, um, yeah. to be a bit brutal, the JCPOA is not about, not about regional stability. The JCPOA is a non-proliferation agreement. Now, that doesn't mean that what happens in the region cannot affect the effectiveness of the JCPOA, nor the political context in which it has to exist. But regional stability is not a criteria for the JCPOA in itself. The problem with the agreement and what happened after the agreement is something that is basically lacking in the region, no matter from which angle you look at it. And that is that there is no inclusive security arrangement or architecture, which both forces and voluntarily brings in all the parties. Insofar that there are security arrangements in this region, they always have a pointy end pointed towards some other country in the same region. So in that sense, there is no way that the JCPOA in and of itself can remedy this very basic flaw of how the states in this region interact with one another. You can leave out all the ideology from every side out of it, and this will still remain the basic problem. So in that sense, I think we're being a bit unfair, uh, whether it is uh, out of you know, whether it is sincere or not, we are being a bit unfair to the JCPOA and what the whole thing is about when we are trying to make it into something that has to solve everyone's problem. That's the first point. The second point is that the, the train, as we say in Swedish, the train that the Saudis and other missed last time around was basically to come up with something that looked like realistic demands or expectations, which they could bring into a negotiation with Iran on those regional issues. If you make a laundry list and you say Iran has to withdraw from all countries in the region, uh, first of all, the question is, what do you mean by that in terms of what are they withdrawing from? Secondly, you're basically trying to make them give up everything that they consider part of their deterrence in order for you to normalize your relations with them, but they will be left with no defensive capacity at all. That's not realistic. So what the Saudis should have done back then was to sit down and have a much more realistic conversation with Iran. And then you could have called the Iranian bluff if it was the case that Iran was not sincere in what it wanted to do in terms of reconciliation on a regional level. But no one did. Instead, what all sides do, where they're coming up with these ridiculously unrealistic demands and they want someone else to fix that for them. And, you know, no matter what you think of the relationship between the United States and Israel, the United States and Saudi Arabia, in the end, the United States is not going to carry water for other countries. It's going to be about its own national interest. Now, of course, that could include Israel, for instance. Sure. But in the end, it's going to be about the United States. So when the Saudis, for instance, basically expect the US to negotiate on their behalf on a list of demands that not even the US can get Iran to do, because it basically amounts to a total capitulation, uh, you know, that's not realistic. You have to come up with something that is much more realistic. 
And in the end, for that to work, all the parties are going to have to agree to sit down and talk to each other. Nothing else is going to work in the long run. You know, selling arms to this or that and an arms race, whatever it looks like, isn't going to create more security, not even hard security, let alone uh, human security. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, will, I think we have time for one last round of, of questions. And if you can be brief in your answers and then immediately go to the concluding remarks, remarks while you do that, then we'll be able to finish on time. So I'm gonna go uh, into, dive into the questions right away. First one is from Perry Bloom the, um, from the US. What role will the recent set of normalized relations between Israel and various countries such as the UAE likely uh, inform and prioritize Iran's future regional operations? That is, is Iran likely to direct some resources to pressure or undermine these sets of bilateral relations? The second question is from Daniel Surf, the US. How does Iran fund its proxies? Uh, I think that deserves a whole conference. I don't think we can answer that in one minute, but we'll try, my, try our best. Uh, it's not just another panel, it's a whole <laughs> conference. Uh, Sima also from Turkey has another question if you have time to answer. She says, she asks, I know that we do not have time, but nobody asked, how is the $400 billion China-Iran cooperation agreement perceived by the US and Israel, a new and strong leverage for Iran? Uh, if, uh, uh, I, I, I think we should stop here. We have other questions, but we will see if we have more time, we can ask that. Um, Briefly, if we can answer these questions and uh, uh, conclude your remarks, and let me let me see if we can actually. I feel bad. There's only one last question. One last question from uh, Shahram again from the U.S. Prior to 9/11, there was limited Iranian mischief um, in the previous 20 years. U.S. actions shifted the calculus in post 9/11 landscape and created various security vacuums. Uh, our inability to recognize this component uh, is, uh, limits our options in creating viable security arrangements in the region. Why do we continue along this path? Uh, so yeah, uh, this, is, this, uh, this is the last question I have so far. Uh, if we can just answer this and then go to concluding remarks, uh, that'd be great. Even if we take a little bit time beyond the, lim the, the time limit we have, well, I know it's, it's an hour and a half. If we take like just a few minutes more, it's fine. So don't worry about it. Kirsten? Sure, these are fantastic questions, and you're right. We need, you know, another whole day to to discuss them. I'll try to touch quickly on some of them in terms of the role of the Abraham Accords and the Iranian calculus. Will Iran try to undermine them? Um, I, I think they they already have in some ways just by um, their continued activities. But but in any if anything, some of this activity strengthens the accords because it strengthens the certainty of those who are entered into them that they share a common security threat assessment. Um, however, Iran doesn't really need to do too much because while we do think about the potential for, for instance, Israeli and Emirati cyber coordination, it, um, the Emirates and its neighbors are really aware of how close they are to Iran. They don't want to be the front line. So I don't think you'll see, you know, um, Bahrain or the UAE offer to host Israeli military bases or or anything like that that would actually truly increase Iran's threat assessment of their neighborhood. Um, they don't want to invite action by Iran to, to do things that would threaten their, their citizens. You know, anything they do will be behind closed doors. So I don't think, um, I don't think Iran's gonna do a whole lot to undermine them other than what they're already up to right now. If I had another half hour to think about this, I'd probably come up with a bunch of things they'd come up with, but just on the spot, um, I think they, they found them threatening at first and they certainly issued condemnations of them at first, but they've been a little bolstered by the unwillingness of some folks like Kuwait and Oman and Qatar to enter into them yet. Uh, so, so I don't think they felt like they were some sort of force to be reckoned with in a, in a real way other than cyber. Um, in terms of the China-Iran deal, there's a debate in the US, the question was about how the US feels about it. There's a debate in the US about what this really means. Some people are very concerned about it because they do feel like it's the symbol of, of a front that is 
joining forces in anti-Americanism, but that's already been there in terms of disinformation campaigns and the like. What, what the other side of the camp says is that this is really a protocol statement. The, um, this was celebrating 25 years. They did it at 25 years ago. And, um, and that what the $400 billion of potential cooperation really looks like in real terms and you nug down into the deals is about 4 billion, which is not enough to create some sort of alliance threat. So there's still a whole lot of, of watching about where that's going to go. Um, I'll leave those questions there. I just wanna make one little point that we, when we've been talking about, I think Roosevelt made a great point about the JCPOA being about nuclear issue and not Iran's regional misbehaviors. And I just wanna make it clear that the reason that link was sustained between the two in the debates and discussions was because the US looked around for levers when they were criticized by Israel, by the Gulf, by partners saying, you haven't looked out for your own people who are living in these countries. You haven't looked out for us, your partners in the region. Um, when you entered into this agreement, you did give them a free card. You gave them a buy. And the US said, okay, we take this seriously. They looked around for non-kinetic levers. They looked around for measures short of acts of war that would allow them to potentially create some change. Sanctions and the JCPOA were the two options they had. They've tried them both. So now back to the drawing board on, on how to how to address these, assuming we get a nuclear deal and what comes next. I think that's the big prize question right now, but that's why they were linked. And, uh, and that's why we need new answers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ruzbe? Thank you. Um, for a moment, it looked like Kirsten and I would actually agree on everything, but then, um, so first, Abraham Agorge, I agree. Um, we are, you know, uh, first of all, we'll see what those accords will amount to. Um, they're more than a memorandum of understanding, but just how much more of an MOU they are it remains to be seen. And in terms of the ideological battle lines, I think there are those in Iran, whether they're right or wrong is a different issue, who think that in a sense this serves their uh, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli kind of narrative of the other Arabs having, you know, abandoned the Palestinians, etc. But that actually, uh, you know, uh, is of any relevance. I and mean, if anyone listens to that narrative, is a different issue. But I think for the moment, at least, uh, they, they, are, they are not very worried about that in that sense. China-Iran agreement, I agree with Kirsten, it's basically a gilded MOU. Uh, it doesn't amount to very much at the moment. And the Chinese are just as pragmatic as everyone else. Uh, they want to have a good relationship with the US that, of course, weighs much, much more than any good relation with Iran. Their ability to maintain a relationship with Iran is important for them, but not at any cost. And in a sense, you can say as Biden, to some degree, continues the Trump kind of anti-China posture, then uh, having more fun with Iran becomes more fun in Beijing. But it's not going to amount to something, you know, super strategic and definitely not, at least on the basis of what they signed now. Um, so there is a hype about that, both in Iran, for and against, and outside of Iran. But I think it has much more to do with the perceptions that people project on China than it has to do with anything that's actually written in that uh, agreement, if you want to call it that. Now, just want to add something on, on what Kirsten said about sanctions and the JCPOA. I think for me, as an outsider, having, if you will, studied DC from afar, this is one of the basic flaws of how the history is written. The United States have been sanctioning Iran for various reasons, basically since the early 1980s. That is the tried, very, very tried, long policy, which, going back to one of the questions asked, is also the reason why there is such institutional inertia in it. Everyone in US Congress is very happy with sanctions. It's one of the few foreign policy tools that the US Congress has, it doesn't seem immediately to kill anyone, so that's nice. Uh, and you can apply it a bit here and there, and it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, you don't have to deal with the consequences of it until someone actually has to unravel them, and then it turns out it's a big, big headache. Okay, But the thing that hasn't been tried for as long, nearly as long, is the JCPOA. The JCPOA did not get more than basically two years tops to kind of prove itself. So I don't think it's fair to compare them. Sanctions, decades, has not in any way changed Iran's strategic calculus or made them undo anything that they were doing. JCPOA, two years, and then maximum pressure from Trump. So in that sense, I think the jury is still out, and I'm actually quite hopeful about the JCPOA being able to be something better and more constructive than sanctions ever were. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ruzbe. Michael, last word before we turn uh, the mic to uh, uh, Professor uh, Steve. Uh, just, just let if you want to answer very briefly these questions, and then we conclude. Yeah, with, uh, yeah. Uh, very briefly about uh, the Iran-China agreement. Um, I think I wouldn't read too much into it in terms of uh, China investing four hundred billion dollars. Uh, I think this is exaggerated. $400 billion over a period of 25 years means $16 billion a year. China has not invested such a sum in any country in the world. The most invested in the United States, which was its biggest investment was $12 billion one year. So to think that they will invest that in Iran, I think is uh, exaggerated. Uh, they also, I think, uh, uh, attach importance to their relations with Saudi Arabia, no less than with Iran. But I think the significance of this deal is that it signals Chinese uh, willingness to bypass American sanctions, which is what we see on the ground anyway, in terms of uh, oil exports and things like that. Uh, as far as Israeli-Arab normalization is concerned, I just want, want to make a brief point here which is, I believe that one of the drivers that ultimately led to the breakthrough to Israeli Arab normalization, and what we're seeing now is a warm peace, unlike the peace we have with Egypt or Jordan, is a JCPOA, because it drove the point in the region that uh, we cannot rely on the United States to provide stability, that the United States is going to decrease its footprint in the region. And they looked around and said, Who can, with whom can we cooperate on this? Uh, they saw Israel. Israel is here to stay. It's a strong country. I think this was a main driver of normalization between Israelis and Arabs. And this could apply pressure on Iran. And I'm not talking about a military alliance. The Arabs are not going for a military alliance with Israel against Iran. I'm talking about many other areas of uh, cooperation. Final word, uh, it's clear the JCPOA was not designed to provide regional stability. It's an arm control uh, uh, agreement. It is not going to provide regional stability. It has to be addressed through a comprehensive strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Iranian challenge that, that you know, focuses on the region uh, as well. But I will say that even if uh, an agreement is reached, at, and even if the Arabs talk to the Iranians and reach some kind of understandings, this does not resolve uh, Iranian enmity towards Israel. You have a regime with ideological commitment to destroy Israel, and I do not underestimate their, uh, the, the ideological commitment of this regime uh, and its enmity towards Israel. And if Iran continues down the same road, then Israel will do what it has to do in order to protect its national security. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I have a feeling that we need to move the session to Vienna. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was excellent. Uh, I, I really think that this is like, we definitely did not cover everything, but we covered so much. So I'd like to thank you all and uh, turn the mic to uh, Professor Steven Spiegel uh, to, 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 for, for his last, for the last words. <laughs> <laughs> Would you want to be following this tremendous uh, foursome here? Uh, uh, it's so been such a terrific discussion, uh, giving us all so much knowledge uh, that we didn't have. I'm thinking of uh, watching it again, which I never do about anything, so don't tell anyone. But I, uh, yeah, some of you may want to do that, um, to do that uh, too. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think we all understand this very difficult situation a little uh, better, m much more than a little better uh, as a result of this la of the last 90 minutes. And the two people who really make all of this possible, who I want to uh, recognize and thank are Salome Mahajer and Emma, Emily Pistole, who, uh, uh, who, who, as I say, made, it, made us able to see what we've seen. And the same team has a program coming on May 19th, just two weeks uh, from now. It's on the Can the US Still Promote Democracy 
in the MENA region. And uh, the panel of experts will discuss American ex exceptionalism and the Global Democracy Project, a tough task uh, that, uh, for, uh, uh, for this group. You see the information on your uh, uh, screens for May 19th at 8 a.m. Pacific time, ouch. But uh, uh, we have to take account, of course, of where everybody else uh, is uh, on these Zoom sessions of whatever uh, kind. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, sign up for our mailing list shared on the screen in the chat window you see before you uh, and, uh, and that has quickly come on and, um, uh, and you see how effective this group is in organizing meetings. So to conclude, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll add a fourth, <laughs> thank you for uh, what you've all done uh, this, uh, uh, this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what all of you are. Uh, I think we're all gonna be remembering this for a long time. And from now on, when I look at the Iranian situation, I'll be thinking of what was said uh, in the last uh, hour and a half. Thank you all, and this concludes our session. Bye-bye.